Hello everyone. Well, as you heard, my name is uh, Tom de Voort. I work as a security consultant and pen tester for Secura, and also part-time as a uh, PhD student at the uh, Amsterdam UMC um, uh, Academic uh, Medical Center. And um, sometimes I'm pretty interested in uh, cryptographic protocols and Active Directory. And a few months ago, while just uh, looking around, trying to figure out uh, how some secure Windows protocols work, I stumbled uh, across an uh, interesting vulnerability that I'll be talking about uh, right now. So first of all, I will uh, give a quick introduction to uh, NTLM and its relation to the uh, NetLogon protocol. Uh, then I'll talk about some uh, vulnerabilities in this protocol that have been found in the past, and then the new uh, exploits that uh, I myself discovered. Um, so first of all, um, already in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, people already uh, were pretty uncomfortable uh, about sending around passwords in plain text uh, through networks. So in the uh, LAN Manager OS, um, they thought, well, we can use some cryptography here. So instead of sending a uh, password from some client to a server to authenticate, uh, we'll do some cryptography on the password so that the client can prove that they own it without just sending a plain text password uh, over the line, uh, which was pretty um, innovative at the time. Um, nowadays, uh, the scheme that they used, the LM protocol, that was also inherited by early versions of uh, Microsoft Windows, uh, is pretty broken. It used a password as a uh, desk key um, and actually just used seven bytes of this password, uh, which was, is pretty easy to crack nowadays. Uh, but it was a good uh, first effort. Um, so in 1993, uh, this protocol was replaced in Windows by NTLM v1. Um, this combines, combines this with a hash function, uh, MD4, uh, and then separate parts of this uh, hash, of a password hash were encrypted. And that was then used to authenticate to systems. Uh, it was also quite broken because you could still uh, break individual desk keys um, and uh, uh, subvert the authentication system. So this system was updated in 1998. Uh, by NTLM v2 with some cryptographic updates. It still had a number of issues, uh, relay attacks, uh, offline brute force uh, attack issues. Um, so that was replaced as well by a Kerberos authentication. Uh, but NTLM is still widely supported in Windows networks today. I don't think I've ever seen a single case of an Active Directory that had NTLM disabled, probably because that would just break a lot of services. NTLM is also a lot more versatile than Kerberos. It's easier to configure. Um, so it's basically still around uh, everywhere, and which is a fact that I will be uh, exploiting uh, here. So how does this protocol work? The point of NTLM is that some client proves to a server that it uh, knows a certain password without actually sending this password directly to the server. So what happens, a user types in the password at some point, um, then the client uh, computes a cryptographic hash of it, then some surface that it wants to authenticate to sends a random challenge, uh, usually just a, a string of uh, random bytes. Uh, and then the client computes a cryptographic message authentication codes using this password hash and the challenge. With NCLM v2, it's HMAC MD5, but uh, the details don't really uh, matter. Um, then the server well validates this, and if it's correct, it will uh, respond to the client and says, okay, uh, I accept this password, you're logged in. Um, and it uh, will also uh, perform uh, a message authentication code itself, so the client can check that it's talking to the correct server. For this, it uses a, a session key that's also derived from the uh, password hash. And in certain protocols, this session key is then used for other purposes. So, for example, in SMB v3, it's used to encrypt messages. It can also be used for SMB signing, LDAP signing, and sealing. Um, so this session key can um, can be used for other protocols uh, to, uh, for, to protect against relay attacks or to encrypt or authenticate messages. So, of course, um, the server, if the server is not a domain controller, it does not actually know the passwords of the clients or the password hash for that matter, because it would be very inconvenient and pretty insecure to just distribute the password database to every single server in a domain. 
So the server in some way needs to verify this function, uh, but if it doesn't know the password hash, it can't actually compute uh, the message authentication codes. It can't verify whether this is correct. So it has to ask the domain controller. And this is where the netlog on protocol comes in. So the server uh, sends the challenge that it has generated itself and the response it had received, but can't verify to the domain controller. The domain controller will look at the combination and it will say, okay, this is fine. The Mac is computed correctly with the right passwords. Um, by the way, uh, this is the name of the user that's logged in. This is the groups that they are a part of because the server doesn't have access to the entire um, uh, database as well. So that is useful to know. Uh, the domain controller also does the session key computation because that also requires knowledge of the um, of the password. It sends all that to the server and then the server uh, knows the client password was correct. And it says, okay, you're logged in now. And this communication between the server and the DC uh, uses the NetLogon remote protocol. Uh, NetLogon is also the name of a locally running service that does a number of things like changing passwords. Uh, but right now I will be focusing on the uh, uh, RPC protocol that's used to, among other things, um, verify NTLM handshakes. So how does this protocol work? Um, as I said, it's an RPC protocol. Um, so when a system wants to um, connect to the domain controller using NetLogon, it uses the port mapper service to get uh, assigned a dynamic TCP port. If that doesn't work for some reason, port mapper isn't available, the uh, port's not accessible, maybe because of uh, a firewall being present, it will fall back to use port 445 and it will tunnel NetLogon RPC messages over SMB. Um, of course, it's very important that the computer authenticates itself, so not just everyone can start uh, verifying uh, NTLM handshakes and getting uh, uh, session keys. So it uses the com Windows computer password as a shared secret between the domain controller and the clients, and it uses that to generate session keys. It uses that to authenticate itself cryptographically, and then all subsequent messages will be um, uh, signed and sealed, meaning they will be authenticated and they will be encrypted. Uh, nowadays, uh, for this purpose, HMAC SHA-2 is used. And for encryption, uh, AES in the CFB8 mode is uh, applied. There's a good chance you've never heard uh, of the CFB8 mode of operation. I hadn't either. It's similar to other uh, block cipher modes of operations, except, except that it's 16 times slower. It's really obscure. It's uh, pretty interesting. Never really seen it before somewhere else. Um, but yeah, so uh, these two primitives are used uh, to generate um, authenticator values. They're used to encrypt and protect messages. So this should prevent any men in the middles, uh, middle attackers from changing the contents of netlog on messages or snooping on uh, the session keys, for example. And in order to prevent downgrade attacks, uh, modern clients, uh, because encryption is technically optional, but if the server says, oh, I don't support encryption, or if an attacker flips a bit to make it look like the server doesn't support encryption, the client will simply reject the connection. It will refuse to uh, continue communicating. It will not send anything sensitive over the line. So um, two uh, prior NetLogon vulnerabilities have been discovered in uh, recent years. Uh, one particular problem was that um, when a computer submits an NTLM handshake, uh, the domain controller doesn't actually verify whether the computer name mentioned in the NTLM handshake is the same as the actual computer uh, asking for verification. So computer A can submit an NTLM handshake even though this handshake was intended by the client to computer B. What this means is that if you're an attacker and you've com uh, compromised any single uh, computer account in the domain, uh, you can basically impersonate any other computer uh, when someone authenticates to you of using NTLM, which enabled all kinds of attacks because then you can ask for that, uh, that computer session key, uh, you can do uh, relay attacks, you could decrypt uh, SMB v3 messages um, or forge them by pass signing. Uh, which is not great, of course, so this was fixed. The domain controller will now match the computer name that occurs in the NTLM handshake with the name of the computer that has authenticated using the NetLogon remote protocol. Uh, 
Um, but there was a problem there as well, because including the, uh, your name in the NCLM challenge is an optional feature. So if that would simply be stripped, so a client tries to authenticate to a computer and the computer simply doesn't provide a name, the client is okay with that. It continues the uh, handshake. Um, and then when the domain controller doesn't actually see a uh, computer name in the handshake, it will uh, uh, insecurely default to accepting it uh, and skip this whole authentication check. And you could do all, uh, the same attacks all over again. So I got pretty interested uh, to see if it was also possible to attack the rather obscure cryptography being used by a protocol. So I made a little uh, lab, lab setup, created a setup a domain controller, a Windows 10 client, uh, just tried logging into that client uh, to see what, um, uh, what would happen, uh, tried to set up a man in the middle position. And at some point during my experimentation, I suddenly saw unencrypted netlog on messages. No idea where it came from. So I uh, tried to replicate what I was doing. And it turns out that when the uh, client initiates the session over TCP using the dynamic port, uh, it does the whole handshake, it's a negotiation uh, encryption key. Uh, but then when you uh, start blocking off that port by injecting a an, uh, TCP or Steam uh, packets, or in my case, because I accidentally configured my uh, IP tables incorrectly, um, it will fall back to SMB. It will just continue the session. It will not redo the handshake from scratch. But for some strange reason, the client then starts forgetting to encrypt packets. So after falling back from uh, the dynamic port to TCP, it will stop encrypting, it will stop authenticating packets. And the server is also fine with this, even though it has negotiated encryption. If a client suddenly starts sending unencrypted messages, the server will just accept them and will reply to them without using encryption itself as well. Um, the the calls, all the RPC calls still call so-called authenticators, which are uh, uh, values that are computed using this, uh, the secret uh, session key. So if you're a man in the middle attacker, you don't actually know how to spoof these authenticators. But it also doesn't really matter because these authenticators don't really uh, are not based on message content. Uh, they're based on timestamps and uh, sequence numbers. Uh, so if you're an attacker, you can basically change any part of the message except for these authenticators. You just leave them in, don't change them. And that has the result that you as a man in the middle can read and change netlog messages. So how could you exploit it? Well, let's say we have um, some targets uh, with which we have a man in the middle position between the target and a domain controller. So we as an attacker, we start doing an NTLM login with the target. Um, well, the target needs to connect to the DC, does the whole net logon handshake. You just let that pass through as an attacker. Uh, then it will start doing the RPC call to verify the NTLM uh, credentials. And at that point, you simply um, drop the TCP connection, you inject an uh, RST packet, so this will fail. Then the client well, will try again using uh, the SMB uh, uh, tunnel. Uh, and stop encrypting uh, the, uh, its messages due to the bug. You just uh, pass this unencrypted message through to the domain controller. Then the domain controller well, will look at um, your credentials. And if they're incorrect, it will say, well, login fails. Your credentials are uh, wrong. But it will still provide an authenticator. So what you do is you block this uh, domain controller message and you replace it with your own spoofed message while copying the authenticator value. So originally the message says a uh, login failed, and then you replace it with uh, login succeeded. Also, by the way, the user I logged in as is a local administrator on your system. Um, you also have to um, recompute the session key yourself, but since you're the one filling in the original fake password, um, you know how to compute the session key, because if you know the password, you can compute the session key. So I made a small proof of concept of this that will basically just let you log in to any system using the password, let me in. And then the domain controller would tell the system, uh, well, you're a member of the domain administrators group and we are a member of the domain administrators group. You're also effectively local admin and all systems you try to log in on, which means that whenever you have a man in the middle position, you can exploit this and gain local admin access uh, to the system. 
So who's vulnerable to this? Well, the most typical target would be a uh, corporate laptop uh, because uh, there's uh, different avenues for getting a man in the middle position. And usually they have, uh, they have an SMB service running. Um, SMB by default also accepts NTLM authentication, so you can authenticate to that, which basic, which first of all means that by using this exploit, you can get access to all the files on this system. Um, but you can also use the PSXAC method to get uh, remote code execution. Uh, if the uh, laptop doesn't have SMB exposed, you can also use another service, maybe RDP. Basically, any type of Windows service that accepts NTLM authentication. Whenever it accepts NTLM, and you can intercept the messages, uh, the net logon messages, you can uh, authenticate yourself as local admin to that service, which usually results in remote code execution. Uh, getting a man in the middle position, you can use the traditional tactics, ARP spoofing, NDP spoofing, you can set up a uh, fake Wi Fi access points. But in the case when you've got a uh, corporate laptop, um, well, you have physical access, so you can just plug in whatever to the network ports and uh, do your attack that way. Uh, interestingly enough, in the scenario where you have like a uh, stolen net uh, uh, laptop that's protected by BitLogger in TPM only mode, which means that disk is, in, uh, is de decrypted by the TPM and you can't really get into it without uh, knowing the Windows passwords. Um, you can still boot it up to the login screen and then start using this attack to log into this laptop. So it's effectively a BitLocker bypass. Although there's still the condition that you still need this laptop to be able to make a connection to the domain controller. So you still need to connect to the uh, DC yourself if you just find a laptop in a train somewhere, but you don't actually have access to the, um, uh, to the domain, to the corporate network. Uh, you can't use this exploit yet, but when you're actually inside, uh, you could use this uh, technique. So I reported this bug to uh, Microsoft. Uh, it uh, gained a CVSS score of an uh, 8.1. Uh, and I gave the recommendation that, well, first of all, this bug should be fixed. Uh, clients should uh, not stop encrypting their messages uh, whenever this fallback occurs. And uh, besides that, uh, the domain controller should also stop accepting these unencrypted calls after encryption is negotiated. So this would mean that even if um, uh, the client would still be vulnerable because the client is unpatched, if you would patch the domain controller, uh, this attack would no longer work because if you do the fallback on the clients, it will not respond to unencrypted messages. It will not provide an attacker with the authenticator they need to uh, execute the attack. And a patch for this was released during uh, Patch Tuesday in 2019. So that was it, and uh, I think it's time for uh, questions now. Wow, that went wow, that quick. Went quick. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions, so I guess your explanation was pretty clear. Um, okay. So, yeah, um, all I can say is, uh, Tom, thank you very much for your awesome research. <laughs>